have received apparently is 1 crore of rupees, you could have never reinvested 150 crores. And even assuming from your other sources, you have reinvested 150 crores, we will grant you deduction only up to 1 crore of rupees. Fortunately, this is one view which has been examined by Gauli Mahadeva first decision, Karnataka High Court, as also Raj Baba's decision, wherein a correct view has been taken that irrespective of your source of application, if you have reinvested, which is within the permissible limit, and even after applying Section 50C, if you have reinvested a higher amount, there would not arise a difficulty in this case. This is the yeah. principle of impossibility of performance in most of the decisions which we have referred to, especially the Karnataka High Court, was examined and the court was not impressed by that is that the court continued to say that as long as I have reinvested more, you should get exemption. That means that the court desired that you were required to reinvest more from whatsoever sources and 50C provisions would be given full effect. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, sir, number 17, deemed dividend uh, for Mr. Ganesh. Supreme Court judgment recently, in that case, advance was given to HUF. Acceptability, whether in the hands of HUF or in the hands of uh, shareholders, that is an issue. On a plain reading of section 2, subsection 22, it does appear that the only person who can be assessed in respect of an amount which the revenue categorizes as dividend is the shareholder in whose name the shares stand. The problem which arises is, if, if it is a case of deemed dividend, where uh, arising out of a loan made by the company to a person other than the shareholder, and the shareholder has an interest in that concern to which the loan is given, and therefore it constitutes deemed dividend, then in whose hands is that deemed dividend to be assessed? For example, if the loan is made by the company to a partnership firm in which a shareholder has, say, a 25% interest, then it constitutes deemed dividend. The immediate question which arises thereafter is, very well, this deemed dividend falls within the four corners of 22, but in whose hands will you assess the deemed dividend? Will it be in the hands of the shareholder or will it be in the hands of the firm to whom the loan has been given? Now, the Bombay High Court uh, in, in Universal Medicare Private Limited, in a very carefully reasoned and lucid judgment, has said that on a careful analysis of Section 2, Subsection 2, 22, if the loan is given to another entity, that does not mean that that entity becomes liable to be assessed to the extent of the loan on account of deemed dividend. The deemed dividend can be assessed to tax in the hands of the registered shareholder and in the name of that registered shareholder alone. Now, this is not new law. It is, it is very important to understand this. As far back as in the 70s, in the case of C.P. Saradi Mudalya, the Supreme Court again laid down this principle very clearly on an analysis of Section 2, Subsection 22, as it then stood. There are considerable differences between 2, Subsection 22, as it then stood, and 2, Subsection 22, as it now stands. One very important difference is they have added an explanation under which if dividend is paid to an entity other than the shareholder, it can still be considered to be deemed dividend. But the explanation does not say in whose hands. Now, the issue arose in the case of Gopal and Sons. Now, I find it simply astonishing, quite appalling, that Gopal and Sons is argued and decided without any mention at all being made of the judgment either of the Bombay High Court in CIT versus Universal Medicare Private Limited or of the earlier Supreme Court judgment in C.P. Sarathi Mudalya. And there is not even an attempt made to analyze the provisions of the uh, 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 of Section 2, Subsection 22. The court and, regrettably, the council, I don't wish to name any names, <laughs> they proceeded on the totally erroneous implied assumption that if the deemed dividend consists of a loan which is being given, then obviously it should be assessed in the hands of the person to whom the loan has been given. So therefore, this gives rise to several egregious consequences. The person who has taken the loan, it may be a short-term loan, he may pay back the loan, 
but he still stuck with the assessment of the amount as dividend in his hands because that becomes final for all times to come. Now, be that as it may, there are other anomalies also. But what is interesting to notice, if one carefully reads the Gopal and Sons judgment of the Supreme Court, there is, uh, uh, there is mercifully no specific mention of or overruling of the judgment of the Bombay High Court in universal Medicare private liberty. So therefore, I would think that universal Medicare still holds the field and for two or three other reasons as well. The judgment also says in, in several places that in that particular case, in Gopal and Sons' case, the company regarded the HUF as the shareholder and entered the HUF's name as the shareholder in its register, which according to me is contrary to all principles of company law. And in fact, there is a paragraph in C.P. Sarathi Mughalia's judgment where the Supreme Court had earlier said, an HUF is not a legal entity, an HUF can therefore never be a shareholder. The HUF, if it has a beneficial interest in shares, only the name of the karta can be entered in the register of members as a shareholder. But all that has not been noticed, but be that as it may. Therefore, the judgment in Gopal and Sons is capable of being explained and distinguished on the basis and footing that there, the HUF itself was regarded by all and sundry as the shareholder and therefore putting the charge of tax in respect of deemed dividend in the hands of the HUF in the peculiar and extraordinary facts of that case is perhaps justifiable and that does not go against the ratio of the Bombay High Court judgment in universal Medicare. Having said that, there is one, some, something further to support this, this method which, we, which I have thought of to distinguish the judgment in Gopal and Sons and that is that in two paragraphs of the Gopal and Sons judgment, that is paragraph 12 and paragraph 13, the Supreme Court reiterates the well settled principle which is in fact the principle laid down in Universal Medicare that dividend is taxable in the hands of the shareholder. So they don't find any doubt with that proposition, they don't dispute that, they don't cavil at that and they, rather they proceed to treat Gopal and Sons HUF as the shareholder in that case and on that basis and footing they proceed to uphold the charge of income tax in the hands of Gopal and Sons. So therefore, to conclude it, it's a very messy state of affairs. The law is quite murky and in a muddy state and I think it would require a clarificatory judgment in a properly argued matter again before the Supreme Court. But I am satisfied that if this issue arises before a High Court, we can say with some semblance of authority and conviction that Gopal and Sons does not overrule the universal Medicare private limited and the law as it stands today is deemed dividend of any kind including a loan made to any person related to the shareholder can only be assessed in the hands of the shareholder and not in anybody else's hands. Yes. Again, next question again from Mr. Ganesh. Why private private may have taken the credit facility ex private limited uh, had given a guarantee? Subsequently, recovery action was taken against both. The property of ex private was sold. Uh, the question is, uh, the question is we can discuss the principle whether land and building belongs to ex private limited acquired and sold by the banker shall be chargeable to tax in the hands of ex private limited though it is not received as a consideration. If a guarantee is given by an assessor in the ordinary course of carrying on his business and it is a necessary and integral part of his business, then any loss which is incurred as a result of the grant of that guarantee would, without any doubt, be allowable as a business loss in his hands. If on the other hand, the guarantee is given by company A, in order to support company B, which is another group company carrying on a distinct business, and only because it happens to be a group company which cannot raise money on the strength of its own finances and uh, asset position, then the loss which is incurred by company A on account of the grant of the guarantee can perhaps not be considered to be a business loss. It would be in the nature of a capital loss because this is not a transaction which company A has entered into in the ordinary course of carrying on its business. Now the next question which arises is, let us assume a situation where company A has given such a guarantee in order to support the indebtedness or the loans taken by company B which is carrying on a different business. Now as a result of the guarantee 
And if company B runs into problems, if the assets of company A are sold, then the first question which arises is, if there is a capital gain on the assets of, on the sale of the assets of company A, as a result of the guarantee being enforced by the creditor of company B, in whose hands will that capital gain be assessed? Now the capital gain will be accessible only in the hands of the owner of the capital asset, which would be company A. So therefore, if company A has given assets, the original cost of which is say 2 lakhs, and they are sold for 4 lakhs, and that entire 4 lakhs is appropriated by the creditor of company B in order to settle the indebtedness of company B in respect of which company A has given a guarantee, then the consequence would be company A would be liable to pay capital gains tax on the capital gain of 2 lakhs which it incurs, which it has earned, and the entire amount of 4 lakhs which is then appropriated by the creditor of company B would, be only be, would only be a capital loss in the hands of company A and it would not be uh, eligible for any kind of deduction. Now, whether the creditor has recourse to the provisions of surface or not is again of really no consequence because surface merely gives an additional statutory remedy to the creditor who is entitled to invoke it to sell the assets of the judgment creditor and to realize the amount which is due and payable to him. So that right can be exercised against the principal judgment debtor. It can also be exercised against the guarantor. But the mere fact that the power, that power is conferred by surface upon the creditor does not make any difference to the general nature of the transaction. And the legal position which I have mentioned earlier, that it would be a capital loss in the hands of company A, unless the grant of the guarantee itself is a part of the carrying on of its business. Now, whether that claim can be put forward by company A is also something which needs to be carefully investigated. If, for example, company B is carrying on a business which is an adjunct to the business of company A and it is complementary to the business of company A, then it is entirely possible that company A, the guarantee given by company A can be said to be a guarantee given by it in the ordinary course of business and the loss, the whole of that loss can then be claimed as a business loss. Everything would then de uh, therefore depend on the facts and circumstances of the particular case. Question number 19 from Pradeep Bhai, that uh, controversy of any uh, uh, show cause notice concealment versus Section 271.1c provides for levy of penalty. A penalty could be levied in either of the two circumstances. One, for concealment of income or for furnishing inaccurate particulars of income. The issue which is to be examined here is that when an AO in issuing the notice, when an AO in issuing the notice has not specifically mentioned that for what purpose he is requiring you to show cause as to why penalty should not be made. Is he seeking you to book you for the offence of furnishing inaccurate particulars or he is wanting you to be booked for concealment of income? Not telling you specifically or scoring of a particular part in the notice under 271-1C, read with 274. Is he in any manner conveys a weakness or indecisiveness, indecisiveness or that you know it indicates that he has not satisfied himself as to the offence for which I should be penalised. This is the short issue which is sought to be examined here. Now ordinarily what one, is, one would see is that the AO before issuing the notice is statutorily required by the court decisions to record his satisfaction in the body of the assessment order because these proceedings for levy of penalty are flowing from the assessment order. So he has to require record of satisfaction in the assessment order. And thereafter, he issues the notice. So there would be a situation where under, in the body of the order, he records that, you know, that I seek to examine you for the, or book you for the purposes of furnishing inaccurate particulars. 
also. Thereafter, he issues the notice wherein also he tells you that you are required to show cause as to you know why you should not be penalized for furnishing inaccurate particulars. In such circumstances, there would I will believe a valid charge if the satisfaction in the order is properly recorded. There would be. The issue too would be that wherein in the body of the order he has recorded his satisfaction that you have failed to furnish the accurate particulars of income. But while issuing the notice, while issuing the notice he had failed to score off one of the two, would it therefore convey that he is not satisfied or he is being vague about it? I would believe that he is, this would not be something which will be available to the assassin. He has clearly recorded in the body of order that what is his conviction about the offence. Having done so, a failure in not scoring of a particular part could at the most be considered as a technical defect and nothing further than that. But if he has not recorded it in the body of the order and in the notice if he has scored off one of it, it would still continue to be a case wherein he is indecisive, he is vague and he has not satisfied himself about the offence which I am competing. We have series of decisions, I have just placed this for your consideration, wherein a view has been taken that whenever there is a, whenever the KO is vague about it, whether it is by not scoring off or by not recording the satisfaction, in such circumstances, one would, yes, in such circumstances, one would be in a position to claim that the offence is not cured. Also, ever, I have been drawn the attention to 292B, wherein it is said that return on income, etc., is not to be invalid on certain grounds, and which says that no return of income assessment notice, summons, or other proceeding which should include penalties furnished or made or issued or taken or purported to have been furnished or made or issued or taken or in pursuance of any of the provisions of this act shall be invalid or shall be deemed to be invalid merely by reason of any mistake, defect or omission in such return of income, assessment, notice, summons or this. So therefore 292B is once again a provision which is usually resorted to by the revenue department when these cases are sought to be examined. What is the court's view is that you cannot cure a mistake, you know, by, you know, resorting to 292B when there is a fundamental issue. When you have not recorded your satisfaction, when you are not satisfied, then you can't simply take a shelter under 292B is a view which is sought to be taken. In the case, I mean, the facts of the case study is that the assessee has otherwise cooperated in the proceedings. And therefore, the questions which are put up for consideration is that can he not later on contend? My answer to that would be he would surely be permitted to, because of something, a mistake which goes to the root of the mistake, root of the assessment or penalty, is not something which can be cured and which can even be contended even at the appellate stage also. Then, there is another thing which has been, and this is something you know which is interesting, is that apparently I thought that what is being asked, but later on I realized that there is a, you know, a catch over that is, an assessing officer issues a notice stating that you know that you are required to show cause that why you have furnished, in a, why you have furnished inaccurate particulars leading to consignment. Now, as one would see, clause C of 271.1, there are two different situations under which a penalty could be levied. Can there ever be a situation wherein you furnish inaccurate particulars which could lead to concealment of income? Could one not argue that these are two mutually exclusive situations? Either I have furnished inaccurate particulars of income, meaning thereby that I have furnished some particulars of income. So that could be in the circumstances I am not hidden at it. It could be the case that those furnished particulars which I have furnished could be inaccurate. But could it be a case of concealment? I would believe not. And therefore any such notice which is linking the two together once again indicates 
a clear indecisiveness, a vagueness, and therefore it could be said to be a case of no satisfaction, and in such circumstances, such remedies cannot stand the test of section 271.1c. Yeah, next question, what is the subject matter of appeal, but the, in appeal, but the 271.1c. This again is a, you know, is a curious story. That is, in this case, the assessing officer has made two additions. One is he has made an addition on account of gross profit rate. The other one is he has added an income on account of interest, which was offered for taxation in a different year. Assessing officer perhaps did not like that offer, and so therefore he has taxed that income in the current assessment year. Now, the assessee also curiously is contesting in appeal the case of GT addition, but is not contesting the case of interest income addition. Fair. 271.1c has been initiated. The, the, the query doesn't tell us that is it initiated in respect of both the additions or it is in respect of one addition only. Howsoever, I would assume that it is in respect of both the additions. Now, the assessing officer is in a great hurry. He wants to finish off the penalty proceedings in respect of the interest income which you have not contested in appeal. In order to answer that, we need to appreciate the provisions of section 275.1 and the provisions, which stipulates a time limit by which an assessing officer is required to pass a penalty order. We also need to see the provisions of 271.1c and the opening limit of it that wherein the assessing officer is required to pass an order of penalty. Now, you know, combined reading, you know, without taking you further into the other aspects is, the combined reading of this, the answer to that, my answers to those questions which could be debatable is, that for the purposes of passing an order to under section 271.1c, an assessing officer as regards one assessment can pass one has one penalty order. An order is required to be passed under section 271.1c. It does not envisage a situation wherein multiple penalty orders are passed in respect of a concealment flowing from the same assessment order. It could flow from a different assessment order for the same assessment here. Is a different story. But we are examining a situation wherein an assessing officer can he pass two assess two penalty orders? I would believe not, and by virtue of that reading of the provision, the act of assessing officer is something which is not correct. The second is that 271, 275.1, can I take a, as an assessee take a shelter under the proviso or, or under the main provision by stating that, look, there is an appeal pending, and then till that time the appeal is decided, kindly keep the provisions in abeyance. I am using the words kindly with a purpose for the reason that I, I read 275.1 to stipulate the outer limit for the purposes of passing a penalty order. It does not necessarily permit you to call upon an assessing officer to hold on till the time the appeal is decided, though the wisdom would demand that he should hold on till the time the appellate proceedings are concluded. But if he does not wish to do so, he is welcome to pass an order. Perhaps next day after issuing, of course after giving the reasonable time for furnishing the show cause. This would be, in nutshell, would be the answer that there would not be a possibility of passing multiple orders of penalty flowing out of one assessment. Sir, question for Mr. Ganesh. A 148 notice on the, in the name of dead person. CIT appeal uh, cancels the order. Uh, can the assessing officer issue fresh notice in the name of legal heir before 31st March 2017, since within six years? And the second question is, CIT appeal gives direction of the appellate order. So after six years also, whether the notice can be issued as well? The time limit for issuing a reassessment notice under section 148 is laid down by section 149. Now section 150 subsection 1 is a proviso to section 149. And section 150 subsection 1 provides that 
A 148 notice can be issued at any time to give effect to any finding or direction contained in an order passed by any court or authority in any proceeding under the Income Tax Act or any other law. So the question is whether the order of the Commissioner appeals cancelling the order as being without jurisdiction can be an order which measures up to the requirements and fulfills the requisites of uh, Section 150, Subsection 1. Now, it is very important to understand that Section 150 and the associated sections, including the explanation added to Section 153, have been construed by the Supreme Court in a number of judgments, going back to the 60s and 70s, Murlidhar, Bhagavan Das, and so on. Now, the Supreme Court has said in, Momo, in many of these judgments that these provisions, since they relate to provisions concerning limitation for reopening an assessment of an SSE, which would otherwise have attained finality, these provisions have to be construed strictly and narrowly, and the benefit of any ambiguity in these provisions must straight away be given to the SSE. Now, therefore, to interpret subsection 150, well, section 150, subsection 1, it has been laid down that there must be a clear and unequivocal finding or direction contained in the order passed by the court or appellate authority. Only then, the subsequent assessment or the reopening under 148 would be would enjoy the protection of 150 subsection 1. In fact, there are judgments which say that a mere suggestion made by the appellate authority with regard to what would be an appropriate course of action after he sets aside the assessment order would not be enough. There must be a categorical and unequivocal direction. And that direction must be necessary to dispose of the appeal is yet another criterion which was laid down by the Supreme Court in Murlida Bhagavan Das's case. And that direction must also be one which the appellate authority could lawfully give in that proceeding that is in the appeal for the purpose of disposing of that particular appeal. Then there is an added time limit which is uh, laid down by section 150 subsection 2 but I don't want to get into additional complications. Now therefore, these three or four parameters or requirements which are strictly insisted upon by the Supreme Court for the purpose of saving a 148 notice by bringing it within the four corners of section 150 subsection 1 we have to carefully examine by looking at the record of the particular case and in particular the exact wording of the order passed by the Commissioner Appeals, whether those requirements are fulfilled and therefore whether the immunity from limitation under section 150 subsection 1 would be attracted to the subsequent or consequent 148 notice that would be issued by the assessing officer after the appellate order. Next question, 22 again for Mr. Ganesh. Sir, in this case, uh, wrong uh, name, uh, notice was served, served but the uh, name was correct, but the, the wrong PAN number was quoted, and yes, uh, wrong PAN number was quoted. Uh, so subsequent whether you can rectify subsequently by the data, but by that time the six year period had expired. Again, it is necessary to go back to first principles. Under section 148, reasons have to be recorded by the assessing officer, which evidence. That the, uh, that, the assess, that the assessing officer has reason to believe on the basis of the materials contained in the reasons recorded that the assessee's income for a particular assessment year has escaped assessment. So it goes without saying that there cannot be any compliance with these mandatory jurisdictional conditions precedent unless the assessee has been clearly and specifically identified in the reasons recorded. There should not be any ambiguity there cannot be any, uh, any doubt at all, at, all, at all about that. But if the SSE has been clearly and specifically identified, his name has been given, his address has been given, and also the assessment year in respect of which the assessing officer says he has reason to believe that this named SSE's income has escaped assessment in respect of that particular assessment year. If all those requirements are to be found in the reasons which are recorded, then the statutory conditions of section 148 are fulfilled. It is very important to understand that section 148 does not require that any PAN number should at all be set out in the reasons which are recorded under 148. So if reasons are recorded and the SSE is identified and the